Hi, welcome back to my studio practice. It's the 1st of May and that means a new project. Um, we prepared this board with a sky area and a land area on a third to two thirds kind of ratio for this board. And we're preparing this because we want to create a segue between the elasomorphs that I was doing in April and the work that we're going to be doing uh, in May which will be inspired by the work of Henri uh, Rousseau. Uh, but before we do that, there are some uh, finishing uh, touches that need to be uh, done to the last uh, elasomorph that we did before we can continue. So I think that's what we'll do. We'll have a little look. We'll have a little look at that. And... Uh, and we will be good. We will be good to go. So here I'm mixing up um, a mix of burnt umber top right and French ultramarine blue to make a black in with some linseed oil if you're looking at the palette uh, on the right hand side and a small amount which I'm just pouring out now of uh, some fast drying medium and this is to create a thin mix and a glaze um, for the fine detail work that we're doing and some glazing work that's coming up. So over to the painting. This is actually a very nerve wracking time because uh, I'm about to tackle uh, the detailing of the beak, which is very, very fine. Reversing the board there so I can change the angle and move in my preferred way with the brush uh, away from the body. So. And if you notice, just before I took a practice stroke on the glass, which is my palette, just to see the line. Uh, so loading up the brush again, you'll see there's a little bit of rotation going on there to try and get that fine point and just adjusting because this is really nerve wracking. Um, the whole work. culminates with the details that we're about to do right now and so it's absolutely critical that we get this line absolutely straight so there we are down to the tip of the beak and that's the first of the line that's what would be the rima on a, a mouth uh, the line that separates the top lip from the lower lip well in this case we're trying to show the um the separation between the upper and the lower mandible and now I'm leaning into the board a little bit more to flatten out the brush hairs to get a thicker line which tapers off slowly. Now get a little flick there from the brush and uh, that knocks me off line a little bit but I can correct So now having rotated the board round, I'm trying to drag the material a little bit towards, smooth out some of the irregularities and continue down to the tadpole teardrop droplet. There we go, that's that done. Now what I'm aware as well is my hand is leaning on this uh, board and it it is a little bit tacky to the touch. The paint is dried, but it's creating a kind of um, a grippy surface that is um, not ideal to lean on. And we don't want to damage the paint anyway. So in the absence of glassine or wax proof paper or some such, uh, I think I get some sacrificial paper and put it under my hand. If this voiceover is coming out at all, uh, it will be great. Um, this is done 
I'm narrating post-production. So here we go again, just widening out and we taper from a wide wedge close to the hummingbird's uh, face, tapering out slowly and slowly till we get to the tip. You notice we hit a little bump on the board there and that knocked uh, the line out a little bit. I try scraping back, which is always good. So you can remove material with either a paint shaper or in my case, I'm using an embossing tool. I'm not completely happy with it, but later on I will adjust that with some white uh, paint. And so loading up the brush again, the air has gotten to it, so I won't be surprised if we need to um, uh, th thin out that mix again. So fortunately, the hummingbird on the bottom left hand side is the correct way that sits my hand. So I have the sacrificial paper under my hand. Um, and yeah, working out away from the body. So I like to do my um, fine lines uh, away rather than towards the body. back in for some material, rotating the brush to get a fine point. And of course, I'm using my Rosemary & Co. Uh, rigger brushes. I'm not sponsored by them, but I do like their brushes and um, they deliver to the door, so that's perfect for me. And again, the same thing. There's a wedge-shaped taper from the face of the bird out towards the tip and uh, this bird here mirrors the larger hummingbird or the one that's closer to us with the lock on its chest. This taper uh, separating the upper and lower mandibles comes down to a point where some string is going to handle a symbolic object. And so what I do is I use the paper um, underneath my hand as a straight edge. So what I'm trying to do is line up in such a way that I can judge what is roughly vertical load up the brush again and straight in with my line and not so fussy now because the string is going to be thicker so lucky me got it first go uh, but like i said i don't have to be so fussy with that um, now, pick up a new brush, it's another rigger, probably a smaller one because this symbolic object is going to be made from yellow ochre and I may bring in a touch of the um, burnt umber blue mix. Sorry, it's raw umber and French ultramarine blue mix just a little bit to green down that yellow ochre because I'm going to try and hint at a gold. And of course, you would have guessed it by now. There has to be a key to unlock the lock. And so um, thinking about this artwork and its meaning, there is an ecological meaning. Um, there is a green message here. It maybe explains the teardrops. The fact that there's life in the teardrops means that there is hope. There is a secret or something that we have to unlock. There is a message we have to learn. And so we need the key to unlock that message and I think it resides in the love of nature.
to me that's what this artwork um, speaks of is that perhaps the love of nature and this is particularly inspired by Costa Rican uh, nature perhaps uh, the secret of a successful future lies in the eco credentials of a place like Costa Rica which famously uh, is very good at uh, managing their uh, zero carbon or low carbon lifestyle. So this as well as um, detailing the birds uh, beaks was a very fiddly job. Uh, I experimented with tapping or just daubing the paint on with a very very fine point and I was conscious that although the large hummingbird is supposed to be closer to us and the smaller hummingbird is slightly further away I did want to give the illusion that the key would actually fit inside the padlock and so there was a little bit of um, you know, trying to get the measurements um, correct. You'll notice compared with the other videos, I've got a towel underneath the board. So the board doesn't uh, slip around quite as much as it did, although it's not a big problem ever. But it's also uh, very useful for cleaning off the moisture from the brush. Although what I've tried to do this time round, because I know that there's very little painting to do, is that I've got three riggers at my disposal. So I've used one for the black. I'm using this one for the gold and um, we'll see what happens later on in this artwork. Ah, I can see there was a little correction with black there. So the key has a kind of circular uh, handle and I wanted to correct the string, uh, how it holds on to the key. So back into the black mix, this time with a little bit of white to make a grey. And I think uh, what we'll be doing now is trying to show the um, gradient of highlight, perhaps the, sh the sheen or the shine on the beaks uh, and also uh, bring out the string and some of the details on the key. So now I add in um, the remainder of the uh, fast drying medium. And get a suitable grey. Ah yeah, glazing, okay. 
So I've made up a very thin glaze of grey because I wanted to knock back the highlight area on the pupil. So the um, fast fix medium, uh, it's called fast drying medium, makes a, makes a glaze which is very transparent. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was knock back some of the blue from uh, that area and make it more gray. And that would allow me also to try and make the white highlight um, a bit more moon-like. I wanted to create a, a bit of um, mystery there. A little bit of narrative perhaps that that's a moon shining. So ideally uh, a larger brush and uh, perhaps a, a separate clean brush to um, um, blend but there was a nice kind of texture to the um, to the brush strokes and it built up uh, an interesting mottled effect and for me adding a little bit of texture there uh, is of interest it adds a little bit more visual interest so i'm happy to have it happy to experiment with glazing and there is uh, quite a lot of medium to water in that mix although you saw me go back to the water well and uh, dilute it a little bit more um, because the medium is actually very syrupy so but there is a high ratio of medium to water at this point to make a, a very a translucent, transparent glaze. I say translucent because that lets the light through, whereas transparent lets the image through. So there is a difference between it. Now by knocking that area back, the circular disc of the highlight on the eye uh, its moon-like character is more evident, in my imagination anyway. And so what I'm doing now is I'm scumbling. So I'm just dragging uh, the material on top of the white paint so that it picks up some of the lumps and bumps and imperfections left by the uh, paint in that area. And those ridges and peaks uh, grab onto the paint and create a kind of uh, scumbled rough texture. Uh, like the pitted surface of the moon and last of all going in with some lights just to pull out a little bit of the highlights in the the color of the iris soon so you'll see that we'll go in with white and we'll try and we'll try and lift that out a little bit make it more pronounced And so there's only about two more minutes of this um, uh, left. Creating a stronger, a slightly stronger um, centre on the iris. Dobbing on some of the paint, getting ready to turn the brush over and make a kind of sgraffito effect by scratching into it and creating some of the, the detailing that goes on on an interesting uh, iris. And there we are. Scrubbing it in just to create a little bit of uh, haphazard and um, a kind of blending.
Okay. And uh, some other little areas caught my attention too. For instance, the uh, nut at the top of the fretboard, it would be notched so that six strings would go in that area. And also the tuning rollers would be roughed up by many years of um, um, you know, tying the strings round about the rollers. And they become worn and become a little bit discoloured and aged. But what I notice about all my guitars, uh, and I haven't fully fathomed this out, is that they are uh, stringless, so no music can be played on them. There's no sound that can be made from them. So, and at this point, that's it. That work for April is now concluded. And I was interested in um, doing some research on Rousseau, especially the painting called The Dream. And so I did some research and we're just going to call that up now. So. Anne Temkin, Chief Curator of Painting and Sculpture. At MoMA, the Dream was painted by Henri Rousseau in 1910. In particular, the dream Rousseau was a curious figure in, in the early 20th century avant-garde. He was not trained as a painter. He was a self-taught artist whose day job was as a customs agent. His work centered on exotic renditions of jungle scenes. And these are detailed with great precision in terms of the foliage, the animals, the entire jungle landscape. Rousseau never left Paris. But in fact, he got all of his knowledge for the horticultural details by going to the botanical gardens in Paris, by going to the zoos to look at the various birds and animals, by reading lots of magazines that came out at that time that were charting the sort of exotic places that travelers and explorers were just starting to go to on other continents. He called it the dream because obviously there is this very strange situation of an upholstered sofa in the middle of the jungle on which this woman with her two braids sits naked, staring out at the scene ahead of her. And one interpretation of that the artist gave was that the woman was, in fact, reclining on this sofa in some living room in Paris, and she was dreaming this jungle around her. But I think there are so many ways to think about this painting and, and that it's much more fun to leave it open in your mind as to how this lady on the sofa got into this jungle. The Dream, painted in 1910 by the French artist Henri Rousseau, 1844 to 1910. Oil on canvas, six feet, eight inches high by nine and a half feet wide, 204 by 298 centimeters. This large painting depicts a lush jungle with a diverse array of trees, tropical plants, and wild animals. It is made up of flat, overlapping shapes, like a dense collage creating a sense of shallow space. The scene is somewhat dark, but there is enough light to see the abundance of plant and wildlife. Through the leaves, we can see a hint of pale blue sky along the top of the painting. And in the upper right, there's a full moon shining. The lower left quadrant of the painting is filled with a curvaceous nude woman reclining on a couch. 
A woman's body is oriented toward the viewer. She looks to her left, the viewer's right, her face in profile. Her left arm rests on the rounded wooden edge of the dark burgundy couch. Her long waist-length brown hair falls in two loose braids over her right shoulder, covering her right breast, while her left breast is exposed. A gentle light accentuates her shapely body. The pinkish hue of her skin contrasts with the dark, velvety couch. Large, long-stemmed flowers, seven in full bloom and four with closed petals, surround the couch. They are in soft shades of blue, lavender, and rose, and have a flat and exaggerated, with each pointy petal clearly articulate. Just above the in the upper left corner of the painting, is a mass of large, dark green, almond-shaped leaves and intertwining tree branches. A gray bird with extended tangerine-colored wings, perhaps a bird of paradise, emerges from the foliage. The bird is perched on a branch in profile, facing right, echoing the pose of the woman whose head is two feet directly below. Within this cluster of trees, below the bird and behind the couch, is a gray elephant. He peeks from behind the branches with only his head and curled trunk in view, the rest of his body obscured by vegetation. He too is in profile, but he's looking left, possibly at the woman. Above him, towards the middle of the composition, is an orange tree, its branches filled with fruit and spiny green leaves. A bluish black bird with long tail feathers and an orange underbelly sits on a branch in profile facing to the right, silhouetted against the patch of blue sky behind him. Like many of the objects in this painting, the bird appears cut out with distinct edges and a flattened form. Large green plants with long spindly leaves dominate the right side of the painting with a few of the large lavender and rose-colored flowers scattered about. A woman with brown hair and brownish-black skin stands just to the right of center. Her figure is almost lost within the depths of the jungle, except for the whites of her eyes as she stares out at the viewer, the golden flute she plays, and her short skirt with horizontal blue, red, brown, yellow, and gray stripes. A brown monkey hangs from a leafy green tree just behind her. Just below the flute player are a wide-eyed lioness and lion peeking out from the low-lying plant. The lioness, on the left, looks over quizzically at the nude woman. The lion, on the right, crouches down, staring directly at the viewer. To the right of him, in the lower right corner of the painting, a black snake with a salmon pink belly slithers toward the woman on the couch. A variety of broad-leafed vegetation runs along the bottom of the canvas framing this scene. Okay, and so that brings us back to our um, classroom or back into the studio. Uh, so that was interesting research. And um, this board was prepared as a third and two thirds, and there are markings for uh, thirds uh, horizontally as well as vertically. What I noticed from that was that, yes, I believe 
that Rousseau uses a kind of um, uh, the rule of thirds, it's called. Um, so the top third is sky, but what I notice is on the vertical thirds, the jungle seems to taper upwards either side, making a kind of um, semicircle. But then details are placed on the thirds in the form of trees or other kind of material that breaks up this kind of um, raised horizon. Yeah. So yes, they're right. He does use a blue, but to my mind, the blue is always dirtied with something. So is it dirtied with a, an umber or some sort of sienna? Um, that would be interesting to experiment because there is a kind of smokiness in the blue. And so that's what I'm going to do uh, first of all, is build in the blue and decide where I want to put either my moon or my sun or perhaps even a combination of both. Uh, for me, the reason why it's the dream is it's the product of the imagination. It's the product of the imagination of the artist who created it. Um, it says that Rousseau never went to the jungles himself or a tropical rainforest, and I'm lucky that I have. Uh, so he had to use his imagination uh, using you know things that he'd seen in the zoo and try to create it. So I think um, the dream world is the province of the unconscious mind and uh, I think that you know Rousseau is definitely explore, exploring uh, if not the actual jungle certainly a psychological jungle and um, so that's it next time we see you we'll be creating a sky maybe trying to map out uh, this kind of semicircular um, arrangement and uh, plotting in either a sun or a moon or a combination of both. And other than that, thank you so much for joining me again uh, on the 1st of May for the beginning of uh, a brand new project, Project uh, Learning from Rousseau. Um, thank you. I hope you found something that was of interest and um, that um, today's little instalment it inspires creativity in you, wherever you may be. Thanks now. Bye-bye.